forty minutes of exercise, sleeping well, and then you know avoiding unhealthy food. People should take what is called as breaks from sitting. So, sitting is the new smoking. There is a you know term like that because sitting is dangerous for our health. Anything which has sugar, again, that's an addiction. And also one more change in the diet is having early dinner. So and especially those who are twenty plus, once a year we should check blood pressure, sugar, and cholesterol. No amount of alcohol is safe. The diseases can be prevented. So don't give up saying that you know we can't prevent. neurologist and a fit doctor on a mission to prevent people from becoming patients our guest today on the settle a be better podcast is dr sudhir kumar who's going to be talking to us about brain health disease prevention and a lot more so welcome dr sudhir and over to you why don't you begin by telling us a little bit about your personal health and wellbeing story in your current work yeah thank you uh, so as you told my name is dr sudhir kumar and i am a neurologist and uh, basically you know like most doctors i was also very busy in my work still busy and uh, we tend to ignore our health and as a result uh, say about 3 years back what i noticed is that i had put on a lot of weight i had uh, become 100 kgs and then uh, my metabolic parameters like hba1c which is a 3 months average sugar had gone up to 6 which is pre diabetes ldl cholesterol and triglycerides were also abnormal and i was sleeping only about 4 to 5 hours because a lot of work so then i just took a small pause and thought okay let me do something for my health also not only for patients and then uh, the two or three main changes i did i became a runner i started running on a regular basis i increased my sleep duration to 7 hours plus and also started eating healthy food and avoided junk foods like earlier i used to have a lot of soft drinks and samosas and those things so i cut down on those and as a result now my weight from 100 kg is down to 70 71 kg HbA1c is 4.8 or 5, and all the lipid parameters are perfect. Like HDL is more than 50, and triglycerides 43. So that's my, in brief, my own personal journey. That's amazing to know, and uh, you share really great insights on your Twitter and you know daily information that's so useful for us and our users. So thank you so much for that, and that's so true that you know we see that doctors today they have. they are one of the most busiest profession right like they have long working hours sometimes it gets unpredictable and uh, it can be quite taxing on their physical and mental health and doctors unfortunately most doctors we see are the most unfit people unfortunately even uh, you know after being in the healthcare uh, profession right uh, but that's so true i mean if we can uh, see doctors like you already lead a busy life you know who have uh, so much on their plate already to take care of their health to take a pause then definitely all of us can learn from that journey today so thank you so much for sharing that with us uh, and to begin with you know what are some of the most common health issues that people come to you with very often and what are the underlying issues uh, we we'll, we'll look at yeah if i have to look at the most common problems so common problems are common in that you know if you look at neurological problems uh, migraine or headaches are common and then uh, neck pain and back pain those are also common issues and so they are all the in the office or the opd settings and if you look at our emergencies and critical care then stroke what is the paralysis that's quite common and and then other things are you know as the people are living for longer duration we have conditions like alzheimers disease where it's a kind of dementia where people forget a lot and then parkinson's disease where people have uh, tremors and difficulty in moving so these are some of the common problems now if i have to look at you know in just in a brief say so always say that uh, neurological problems like any other problems they are mostly preventable so we cannot just accept the fact that okay you know we had to get the disease so we got the disease it's not like that so uh, so basically you know the, look at the risk factors so you know for almost all of them sedentary lifestyle diabetes hypertension obesity not sleeping adequately junk food uh, not eating enough healthy food so these are some of the basic re- underlying reasons for most of the diseases and uh, that is what so so disease can be prevented but because of various reasons people are not able to take care of those preventable you know situations and then they end up becoming patients that's why i said people can remain people and not convert to patients but unfortunately you know what i have seen in my this is my 30th year as a doctor so i was thinking that you know i am one doctor who wants to see less number of patients i am not you know wanting more patients because you know that's it's a kind of work for all of us 
So despite in the 30 years, the number of doctors have increased, number of hospitals have increased. But if you walk into any hospital or any doctor's chamber, there is a huge queue of patients waiting to see them. So what has happened is despite the increase in the number of hospitals and the number of doctors, the crowd has not reduced, the crowd of patients. And that is one of the things, you know, we should I mean, introspect why it is like that. So it is, it boils down to those factors which I mentioned, unhealthy lifestyle and avoiding the lifestyle that can make us healthy. Right, of course, that makes so much sense. And talking specifically about, you know, neurological diseases, because uh, I don't think we very often uh, get to hear uh, and understand what they are. To firstly begin with, like, are they mostly genetic or lifestyle based? Because something, you know, if we if we talk about diabetes or heart disease, we know that somewhere or the other are now a little bit educated, all of us, that we know it can be uh, prevented and uh, it is lifestyle induced somewhere or the other and we can control these things. But what about neurological diseases? Are they more genetically uh, induced or are they, you know, lifestyle induced? So, And what, what are the things that we can start doing in order to prevent them? See, if I have to give one rough figure, 10% genetic, 90% our lifestyle. And that's a huge number. So which means 90% of conditions or diseases we can prevent or reduce their severity. And then if you look at, say, stroke is the one of the three biggest killers. So other than heart attack and cancer, stroke or paralysis, it causes a disability as well as death. Now for stroke, I've already listed the risk factors. So the only things which are non-modifiable are age because it's more common older people and the family history. So these things we cannot change. But all the rest, you know, when people always we keep hearing that, you know, so, so and so young person, healthy person got heart attack, young and healthy person got uh, stroke. It is, but they're young, but they are not healthy because when they, because we are the doctors seeing them. So when they come to the hospital, you do their, check first check their blood pressure. It is 160 by 90, 170 by 100. Check their hemoglobin, HbA1c, it is 7.5. So what is happening is they are unhealthy, but since they have never had a checkup, they don't know that they are unhealthy. So what is required is, you know, we all, we means anyone who is adolescent, even in the recent uh, news you must have uh, read, that youngsters who were dancing in you know in Garba nights, many of them had heart attacks and uh, you know some of them died also unfortunately. But so in in adolescents also we have found the same risk factors: obesity, high cholesterol, high blood pressure. So basically, right from teenage, and especially those who are 20 plus, once in a year we should check blood pressure, sugar, and cholesterol because they may not have any symptoms. When my BP is 160 or when my sugar is high, I may not have any symptoms. Still, I get some disease. So, so we need to check these parameters and, and then uh, those people who have abnormal reports, they need to take more care. But even those who are so-called healthy, the only way to become, remain healthy and not become unhealthy is to take care of these things. So 40 minutes of exercise, sleeping well, and then, you know, avoiding unhealthy food or junk foods. So that is the key to prevent all these things. Other thing which I mentioned is neck and back pain. It is mainly because of our lifestyle. See, today most people, most professions, they need to sit for very long duration. 9 to 10 hours is routine. And even beyond uh, office hours, they need they need or they are watching TV or some, you know, YouTube or something on the screen. So screen time, sitting time has become more. And uh, we know that sedentary lifestyle is a risk factor not only for obesity, but also for neck and back pain. It causes degeneration of the uh, discs so the disc can bulge and start putting pressure on the nerves so what is required is people should take what is called as breaks from sitting so once somebody has reached say 30 40 minutes get up from the chair move for 30 seconds 45 seconds and then come back that can make a big difference and minimize the total number of hours so job we cannot avoid but beyond office hours at least minimize sitting and a few other things we can do is, you know, we always have some tea breaks and coffee breaks in the office. That can be had while standing, need not sit for that. And, uh, you know, things like that, small changes. When there is an elevator in the office and staircase, try to use the staircase more often. So few changes like this can make a big difference. Right. That makes so much sense. And these are some great insights, some really easy to do that we can keep in our mind. And like you rightly said, you know, we see a lot of uh, apparently healthy people uh, have heart attacks, have stroke, and we are there questioning ourselves that, you know, 
they were the ones who seemed the most healthiest and you know one of the things is that we've seen so many people have uh, strokes at the gym like these are the people who uh, are strength training regularly who are you know uh, putting emphasis on protein but clearly uh, that is not all we need right like just strength training and uh, ensuring you have enough protein is really not enough for us so what are they missing out on you know some people who are really active in their life like they might be uh, strength training three four times a week they might be doing their cardio they might be having a clean enough diet but still they might be at some or the other risk of you know heart disease uh, how can that be prevented and what are some other things that they should definitely uh, keep in their mind alongside these two things i think there are two or three points one is the sleep component so you know most people who who are in the gym and they think many of them they don't have enough time to sleep because they are doing full time job and then spending good amount of time in the gym and then post that they may be having good social or the night life which is like late night parties so by the time you get back it's like 11:30 12 or whatever time so basically the minimum duration of sleep we require is 7 hours now if you are sleeping less than 7 hours it increases the risk of everything right from obesity diabetes hypertension heart attack stroke cancer and death so it is like that so sleep is one thing which people must focus on it is the simplest thing to do you know just have to lie down on the bed and it doesn't need anything else but still 70% of people or 60% of people don't get adequate sleep in the world and same thing may be true in indian cities also in villages i know that people sleep because these so called you know good habits of night life or social life is not there in villages but in city life i think uh, two thirds of people are not getting adequate sleep the second thing most people are missing youngsters is the you know happy or relaxed state of mind so stress is very common when i meet people in my opd almost 90% of people say doctor what what kind of question are you asking how can there be no stress in life life means stress so stress has become synonymous with living which is not which need not be you know so some of the things people are doing extra is like one is the working hours are prolonged overworking is more common so that leaves lesser time for relaxation or the me time or the self time less time to interact with family members or friends less time for pursuing any hobbies because you know singing painting whatever these things are relaxing but people don't have time for that taking breaks from the office going for vacations you know so those things are less and also probably the financial so what is happening is now in our parent generation they used to think of buying a house towards retirement you know that phase now when the people get their first salary they want to buy a house and start paying emis and uh, that can put a lot of strain and stress on the person's uh, this thing uh, mind so i think sleep and stress i would point out as two most important things and third thing not to forget is the over working or over uh, you know working out so we know that you know from the studies that whether it is aerobic or whether it is strength training there is a threshold up to which it benefits if somebody does more than that benefits don't become more but it has a declining uh, effect on the health so right. for aerobics it may be let's say if i am a runner so running maybe you know uh, if you are doing say 40 50 kilometers in a week that may be good but you know i know people who do 100 or even i was doing in the beginning but now i have reduced so over running can be dangerous and we know that same thing in gym up to 90 minutes in a week may be ideal but some who are well trained can do more also but ideally it is not you know to do 2 hours of strength training every day it's not recommended may have hazardous effect so over working out should be avoided right of course and unfortunately we have really glamorized overworking and undersleeping a lot like it has become this thing that you know in the morning you'd go to the office you know i work till 2 uh, o'clock in the morning i just slept for 4 hours and i'm still here it has become a thing that we've glamorized unfortunately and we definitely need to take a step back and take a pause and there are definitely people who who look very active who look very fit and who might be overworking in the gym but we need that time for recovery so that's very true like even if we are putting in the efforts more efforts at the gym we should be doing exactly as much as to recover and that's something that most of us forget so that makes so much sense and talking about uh, you know uh, brain health specifically as a neurologist so two things away of what are the things that we should definitely start doing uh, starting this new year that would help us uh, you know prevent uh, cognitive decline as we age it would improve our brain health what are some to do's and what are some things that we should absolutely stop doing like avoid them which might be affecting our brain health in a bad way but we don't even notice 
Yeah, that's a very important and good question. And generally, whatever is good for the body, it is good for the brain also. But still, I need to highlight them one by one. And let's say I always start with the sleep. So, uh, you know, most of the things, good things in the brain happen when we are sleeping. So, right, there's a hormone called growth hormone. That secretion happens during uh, sleep. So, children who sleep less, they may be growing less. And uh, second thing is our memory. You know, we have all uh, studied till late nights, you know, before exams. But the consolidation of memory happens during sleep. So, if someone doesn't sleep adequately, the memory may not be that good. So, good sleep is the most important. And then when we wake up, you know, the early morning exercise is very useful. And we can have a rule, you know, forget those who are elite runners or those who are, you know, competing in the national and international events. But for most of us, 99% people, 5 days in a week of aerobics, 30 to 40 minutes and 3 days of strength training, 30 minutes each is ideal and adequate. That way we can sustain, you know, we can do something which can be sustained throughout the life and not just for one year or few months. So both aerobic and strength training and these have direct benefits on the brain health also because it improves the blood circulation to the brain. The risk factors which can affect brain like diabetes, hypertension and obesity, they also become less because of this. And the third thing will be the diet. So diet, there are some specific things which are good for the brain, which means, you know, people who, have, who can take handful of nuts. So not too much of nuts. So handful of nuts per day, whether it's almonds or walnuts or hazelnuts. So combination of that. And then, uh, you know, fish. Fish is also very good because it has omega-3 fatty acids. So certain fish like salmons, and also if we have access to that, they're uh, more useful. And then uh, certain seeds like chia seeds and some berries like blueberries. So some of these diets are uh, very, very brain healthy. And we have to also avoid the unhealthy foods, which are mainly ultra processed packaged foods. They're all fancy kept in the, you know, when you walk into the stores, only those things are displayed. But generally, whatever is packed in, the, in a packet and kept has a long shelf life may not be so healthy. So we have to avoid that. And then uh, these habits like smoking, alcohol, both have bad effects on the health. So better to stay away from these. No amount of alcohol is safe. People may be telling that drink small amounts, but that is also unhealthy. We should avoid alcohol totally. And most of the accidents happen under the influence of alcohol. So alcohol has a direct effect on the brain and can increase the risk of accidents also. And then, so I think some of these, and then also use the brain more. So sitting idle is not good. So try to learn something new, some new skill. At any age, we can learn a new skill. Uh, try to solve crossword puzzles, sudokus, read a book or write story. So reading and writing. So whatever, you know, puts little bit of effort on the brain is good for the brain. But just sitting and watching a TV, it may not be the best thing. Right, of course. And we definitely estimate, you know, how much of an effect can learning something new have uh, on our brain health. And, you know, the neuroplasticity is something that we have completely stopped working on after a certain age when we just get busy in our job and just get busy with the targets and forget to do something new, learn something new. And I think physical movement is one of the best things, like correct me if I'm wrong, but if you start a new physical training, a new sport for that matter, it's like it has to be whole brain integration. It has to be, uh, you know, a, a new learning for you, right? So, I mean, that can be one of the most fun ways uh, to go for that. And even if you can't really, don't really want to be that artistic and go for painting and music and dancing. But, you know, physical training is one of the best ways. You'll be physically fit. You'll uh, get to do a sport, meet people. So, that's that's one thing to keep in mind. So, thank you for sharing that with us. And, you know, talking about workplace health uh, balance, what are some things that, you would love to see change in a corporate uh, world, you know, like in corporates, what would you like to see uh, founders and bosses take efforts and what are some things that they can do for their employees' well-being? Yeah, see, one thing commonly I hear from most people who come from the corporate world is that most of them have very, very stiff targets. So, so uh, and targets are such that they, they need to work for 12, 13 hours. So that culture has to change and they're always under threat because they say, if I say something against it, then I may get replaced by somebody else because somebody else is there who's willing to put in that much. So it's not the, it's not that, you know, we have to glamorize those who work for 13, 14 hours. It's not healthy in the long term. So that is one and then have reasonable targets. We know that there are competitions between different companies to perform. 
but it should not be at the cost of uh, you know employees health and uh, and then as i mentioned now we have uh, this sitting is the new smoking there is a you know term like that because sitting is dangerous for our health so we can have uh, desks which are standing desks some offices have already started so standing is better than sitting even meetings so meetings the person who is speaking stands and the rest of us we sit and listen so possibly we can arrange you know tables uh, where people can stand and listen to the speaker and right. as i already mentioned coffee and tea breaks can be in standing position <coughs> sorry and then also the snacks you know many offices have snacks which are unhealthy right. so there will be some coffee and tea and then uh, cookies and samosas or something to go by so we can change that and have healthy snack options at in the offices also and then uh, many of them work towards the american shifts so timings are odd but that can be in uh, rotation so one person need not do all the night shifts so we can keep rotating right of course these are some great easy insights to think about and to take care of definitely uh, we can and we already are seeing some of these changes happen in uh, many companies so that's really good news for us and lastly you know you uh, you are a doctor with such a busy schedule what would be what are your some non health non negotiables what's a what does a week in your life look like and what are some things that you are very disciplined about one thing i was i already noticed when we spoke earlier uh, was that you sleep by 10 o'clock you like to sleep early so that is one amazing highlight but what are some other things that you absolutely disciplined about and those are your health non negotiables i think in the last 3 years uh, i have uh, made lot of changes so in that one is uh, as you mentioned sleep so 10 to 5 plus minus 30 minutes so 7 hours is the minimum I, i should sleep whatever happens so i don't uh, have any night engagements if any meetings are there it should be finished uh, you know much earlier or even if meeting is ongoing i'll keep my session early so that i can leave early with some excuse so of course you know some people may not like it but in the end we have to do what is good for us and uh, second thing is uh, the working hours so we doctors have three kinds of work one is seeing patients second is teaching because we are teachers we have to teach our post graduate students and research so the first and second definitely we can finish in our scheduled time of the work research is something you know i have done lots so we have to say okay fine we'll put a put a you know break on that so that the working hours don't get extended because i was doing 3 to 4 hours of writing research papers till 1 o'clock in the night early which i have uh, discontinued now and then uh, this exercise is a habit so once we start doing it for a, for a month then the day you don't go out your body will crave for it it's an addiction so if somebody needs to have an addiction instead of getting addicted to say alcohol or smoking or drugs i'll say get addicted to exercise because yes. that's a very very good and healthy addiction and it's the it works on the same part of brain it is the dopamine which gets released so we'll hear of the something called as runners, runners high or post gym workout high so that feeling nothing can replace so you know that is something which i started in the morning i was a person who never used to see sunrise before but now in the last 3 years i have captured so many beautiful sunrises so if you get up at 5:30 in the morning and go out so you see a different world which is not seen after 8 o'clock so the people you know just the people the birds chirping the air is cooler and fresher because in cities we have so much of pollution but at that morning time the pollution is not so much so that is an habit which i started and it's become like an addiction so early morning running and uh, some exercise for one hour say 5:30 to 6:30 and then i mentioned briefly about my diet so i was you know almost uh, one or two uh, soft drinks and samosas earlier so but in the last 3 years i haven't touched soft drinks so anything which has sugar again that's an addiction so whether it's a sweets or desserts or cakes or ice creams if you keep on having the brain craves for it more but if we can keep away from sugar for a month the craving doesn't come in fact now my tea and coffee when i uh, don't get without sugar i don't feel like having it with sugar it, it tastes little different and right. not uh, so what is that is one thing another change i have made in my diet i have reduced carbohydrates i have not cut down completely but reduced and then increased my proteins i, I am a non vegetarian so i have many options for protein so these are some of the changes in the diet and also one more change in the diet is having early dinner so i used to have dinner at say 10 10:30 now it's down to 7 7:30 so early dinner has got lot of advantages you know 
it's not like typical intermittent fasting but basically you'll have i'll have what say you know 13 to 14 hours gap between my dinner and the breakfast so that gap is also very very important so if you have what is called as time restricted feeding so finish your all the meals in a limited window so for me the window is 9 am in the morning till 7 so that's about 10 hours so that's that's also have a lot of uh, you know beneficial effects on the body that can be a separate topic for discussion intermittent fasting which has effects on the weight loss again diabetes control bp control yeah. and other other things so these are some of the changes and definitely you know i stick to that and and once you get used to it you will start enjoying it. it's not like a punishment many people when i tell this for the first time uh, they feel then what kind is this life are you you're not living a good life so i said no, no once you enjoy it that is life you know somebody who is not who having parties at late night till 11:30 12 i feel that that is not life because that time in, in my good i'm having a sound sleep at that time so i think that's uh, that's much better than you know dancing in a bar having alcohol at 11:30 So that is my way of thinking. <laughs> Absolutely, and especially the point of having early dinners. I mean, that just making that one change can have such a major impact on our sleep as well. Right? Like, correct me if I'm wrong, but when most of us are like used to having dinner and immediately going to sleep, right? I mean, that's one of the worst things that we can do, and I, that can be one of the reasons that we. might have slept for 7 8 hours but we still woke up tired and we uh, still don't feel like yes. we slept enough because this, we just there is a, just to interrupt there is a disease called gerd gastroesophageal okay. reflux disease so this and that which called acidity it is right. uh, it can be prevented if people have early dinner and as per research say 3 to 4 hours before your sleep time if you can have dinner the gerd can be prevented to a great extent right of course and we do have like if we talk about acidity also people who have an, an habit of eating very late over like you know one of the two days or it's fine you know you might have missed it or something but then if you do it every single day it can really cause major issues later on so that's something we definitely uh, ignore so thank you for these amazing insights dr sudhir this brings us to the end of the episode today as we conclude do you have any last messages or thoughts to leave us with i think uh, thank you i think we have covered most of it in our talk today and uh, so they are all uh, simple uh, tips nothing difficult and great about it and the aim is that one message i want to leave is that the diseases can be prevented so don't give up saying that you know we can't prevent so 90% of times we can uh, prevent diseases and even though i am a doctor i my advice to all of you is that try to stay away from the doctors as much as possible so stay away from doctors stay away from the hospitals and the only way to do it is to you know become healthy and remain healthy Absolutely, that's a fresh perspective coming from a doctor, and it's a lovely message. Thank you so much uh, for sharing these great insights with us. I'm sure this was very insightful for our audience and really easy tips. No matter what profession you belong to, you can start doing these little things, and I hope we start seeing this change collectively as corporates and companies to make it a lot more easier for all of us to, you know, become healthier together. So, thank you so much once again, Dr. Sudhir. Uh, this was an amazing episode. That's it for today's episode. I am Sakshi Pawar, and I'll be your host for the Settle or We Were podcast. Stay tuned. Are you bring more inspiring stories? You know the drill. Subscribe to the Settle or Be Better podcast. Like, share, and comment on our videos, and oh, hit the bell icon because you don't want to miss the mind-boggling health discussions we're about to bring for you. Why settle when you can be better?